All right, well, thank you, Joel, and thank you, Looker, and thank you all for coming out. Um, I know this is a little different than a lot of the talks that, you, uh, uh, that you're listening to in these, uh, these few days. Uh, forgive the pun, I, I put up this alternate uh, title to try and emphasize the link between what you do and what I do. Of course, it's not just hex data, but it's other forms of data as well. Um, and, and that link between data and, and ocean policy. And so the issue here, and the main point that I want to make, so I'll make it now in case some of you have to leave, is that we can do a lot better on sustainable oceans, and in order to do that, we need data. And so we need to do smart things with the data, to, to do intelligent things, uh, to try and advance that particular agenda. And so my own interest, I'm a biological oceanographer, so ocean biodiversity is my main research topic, and so I will uh, get into that today, but specifically in the sense, in the context, if you like, of um, data and what we can do with data uh, and some of the challenges associated with that. And so the ocean, of course, offers us many benefits and many opportunities, but at the same time, also a lot of problems. And so we have a lot of issues today with the oceans and, and what we do uh, with the ocean uh, in terms of uh, invasive species, pollution, overfishing, um, a whole variety of, of, of problems. And so we could spend the next 45 minutes discussing that, but I really do not want to do that. Um, I want to talk about solutions and challenges uh, rather than simply problems. But I do want to show you a few examples um, of some of the challenges that we face. And so um, I come from Newfoundland, Canada, which is on the East Coast. It's a big island. Some of you may have heard of it. Some of you may not. Uh, but one of the things that brought people to Newfoundland was fishing. And so when the first Europeans arrived in the late 1400s, they could catch codfish by lowering buckets over the side of the ship. They were that plentiful. And so we fished it. We fished it very hard. And by 1992, uh, we had actually fished it to the point where moratorium was declared. And so what happened then is that 30,000 people of a population of 500,000 were thrown out of work overnight. And so this is the sort of thing that can happen with poor ocean policy if we don't manage ocean resources effectively um, and, uh, and produce something that is more sustainable. And so part of the issue here, and you'll see this um, image in the upper um, uh, right-hand corner, is uh, that we've seen changes in natural populations. Now this is a photograph from around 1900. Now this is a particularly big fish even for 1900, but my grandfather, when he went out fishing, would catch fish maybe half that size as the best that he would see. More recently, the, the size then is half again of that. So the point here is what we see is something called shifting baselines. And the idea here is that our expectations of the oceans have shifted over time. And so what we think of as normal is not what was normal 100 years ago, um, although those changes have been ongoing for longer than you think. Again, we tend to think of our impacts as those during our lifetimes, but in fact, they go well beyond that, as you'll see um, in just a few moments. Another example of this is walrus. This is something that used to be abundant in Newfoundland waters, and it's something I did not even know had existed, even though I grew up there, um, until a few years ago. And so again, this shifting baseline, this new normal that we see in, in, in nature. Now, part of the challenge is that the, uh, the systematic collection of ocean data really only began post-World War II. And so trying to understand what the ocean looked like before World War II requires that we look to alternate data sources. So these might include sources such as restaurant menus, uh, ships' logs, paintings from Europe uh, from hundreds of years ago, um, and even historical photographs. So you see here, uh, these are actually tuna fish from the North Sea um, at a fish market in Denmark. Another example of this is a fishing derby in, in Florida. Uh, you see catches from the 1950s, which are quite impressive. Uh, by the 1980s, these catches had decreased quite a bit, both in terms of the size of the fish, but also the composition of those fish. And then by 2007, these are the winning fish from the, the derby, uh, were actually quite laughable compared to what was collected in the, in the 1950s. But of course, this is no laughing matter. It's a serious problem that we are significantly overfishing um, the oceans. So um, I somewhat facetiously say that the good news is that we have only driven 18 species in the ocean to extinction. Um, now, I say that facetiously uh, because I think many people think there are many more. There are a couple of caveats to that, and I would say that um, 11 of those 18 happen to need to breathe air, and so they're much easier targets uh, for hunting. Uh, but the point here is that we tend to think there are a lot more. But we certainly shouldn't pat ourselves on the back. Uh, the problem is much more serious than that in that uh, almost every coastal area where humans settle has caused local extirpations and loss of species in those environments. So that's happening all over the world. So it's just global extinctions that are relatively rare. But the second issue that I should raise is that these are known extinctions. There are a lot of potential hidden extinctions. 
The classic example of this is coral reefs, where we really don't know a lot about the biota, but we know that coral reefs are in serious trouble in terms of bleaching and other uh, forms of environmental deterioration. So we are almost certainly losing species from coral reefs without even knowing they existed. The other thing I should talk about in terms of these local extirpations is that we often lose genetic diversity, and so the capacity to adapt to particular environments may be lost if we completely eliminate them from that environment. So the assumption that if we overfish one area, that adjacent fish can simply colonize may not be true in some instances. And so there, there really is a big problem there. Now, a lot of you think about data, and I suspect many of you think about it in both space and in time. Uh, you wouldn't try to sell suntan lotion in Alaska um, uh, or, or down jackets uh, in the tropics. Uh, the same problem exists in oceanography. We have a challenge of both um, uh, space and time and, uh, and how to, to deal with that. So for oceanography, the, the huge challenge is just the massive size of the ocean environment. And so as you can see here, we have uh, a, a different depiction of the oceans. Uh, and it shows you that 95% of our planet, in terms of its volume, where species can live, is actually ocean. And so I think Arthur C. Clarke had it right when he said that we really ought to call planet Earth planet ocean. It's a much better descriptor. And so the other thing about this is that you can see how interconnected it is. And to illustrate this point, uh, let me just start up this, uh, this video. Um, we really only have one planet and one ocean. And the idea of the one ocean is that all of the oceans flow into one another, whether it's Pacific and the Atlantic and Indian and so on, they're all interconnected in space. What you're seeing behind me is a model of ocean circulation with temperature superimposed over it. And I put this up here to illustrate a couple of, of points. First of all, just how dynamic the ocean is. It's changing very much in time as well as in space. Um, a second point about this is, again, the interconnectedness of it. And so pollutants that we put into the water off the east coast of North America could eventually um, end up in the, the coast of Europe um, and further as well. And so um, the challenge for us then as ocean scientists is one of scale but also one of complexity. And how do we collect data that address those issues uh, effectively? Now, as I said, I'm a biological oceanographer, but biology responds to the environment in which the organisms live, and so I need to interact then with chemists and physicists and geologists to really understand why biology varies in both space and in time. And so um, you may think that we know a lot about the ocean, and we do, but in fact, there are a lot of very basic questions that we cannot answer for much of the ocean environment. So for example, simply knowing who lives in a given location is not a given. In many cases, we do not know that basic information. A second question is how are the populations and habitats connected to one another? Now, the uh, illustration that I put up here is actually um, a route map of Air Canada. It shows you how I got here from the East Coast. Uh, the point here is that if my airport in St. John's shuts down, it's a nuisance for me, but it doesn't disrupt Canada. If Toronto or Vancouver shuts down, it's a major problem for the whole country. This is true for biological populations that are interconnected in the same way. Some populations are much more important to future generations than others, and knowing when that's true helps us as, uh, as managers uh, of ocean resource extraction. A third issue is how can we predict where organisms live? The reality is in that any of our lifetimes, we will not sample all of the ocean. We may as well not even try. It's not going to happen. And so we need to come up with shortcuts or predictive tools to try and understand where we're likely to find different types of environments and species. A fourth question is how do these organisms impact the way the Earth works? We're all breathing air. We're all eating food uh, shortly for lunch. Uh, and so organisms play a key role in that process and in how those cycles that maintain life on Earth work. And so trying to understand the role of different species then becomes a key part of the question. We can also ask, how do they respond to perturbation? If we overfish, if we put pollutants in, which species will suffer, which ones can manage? Knowing something about that can make us more effective, again, as ocean users. And then finally, how do we take all of that information and apply it to better ocean policy, the way that society interacts with the ocean. One final point I want to make before I leave this slide is that we will never manage the ocean. We can manage people, but the ocean, themsel the ocean itself is just too complex uh, to try and really manage it the way we manage on land. Um, but we can manage people, and that's really what, uh, what this is all about. Now, um, until perhaps 50 years ago, the way that we sampled the ocean was to lower various instruments, such as this plumb line used in the first oceanographic expeditions, which we dropped to the bottom to figure out how deep the, the ocean was. So it sounds pretty crude. We've improved on that somewhat, 
but we still use a whole variety of nets and bottles and grabs to try and figure out blindly what's going on below the ocean surface. Um, and so fortunately, we've done better than that. We've learned a lot from those tools, and we still use them, but we have other techniques as well. Now, um, you look at these images, and you might guess what film this is from. I suspect you may not be able to, because they're simple uh, uh, grabs from uh, a movie. But if you see a couple of more images, it starts to become clear. Aha, yes, these people look familiar. And the movie, of course, is Casablanca, which many of you will have seen. Now, the problem with ocean research is that we also suffer from snapshots that are often very incomplete. So when we want to see a whole movie, we often only see a little excerpt. And we have to try and extrapolate from that small excerpt as to what goes on. And so um, things have improved. So for example, uh, we now use satellites to understand ocean change. What you're looking at here is a simulation, it's actually a movie, of productivity in the ocean. So the, the, um, uh, the bright yellow colors show highly productive periods. The blues are unproductive periods. And you can see that some areas of the ocean are much more productive than others. And there's a strong seasonality depending on where you are. The problem, though, with this approach is that it's taught us a whole lot about the surface of the ocean, but it doesn't see below the surface. Satellites really are focused on surface layers, the skin of the apple, if you will. So we still remained uh, blind, if you like, the sea blindness uh, to the deeper layers of the ocean without other tools. And so this is what most, most of the ocean looks like. Uh, it's pitch black once you get below the surface, the surface layer where uh, uh, photosynthesis goes on. Below that, there's a layer where there's a little bit of light, but not enough to support photosynthesis. And then you're in pitch blackness. And so most of the world looks like this. Now, if you uh, go down in a submersible and turn on your light, you'll see some spectacular organisms. Some are bioluminescent. But for the most part, uh, it's pitch black and not a whole lot to see in terms of abundance. When you finally get to the bottom, this is the sort of seascape that you see. This sort of environment covers more of this planet than all other habitats combined. And that's true for land and ocean and so on. This is our planet, whether you like it or not. Um, and again, very poorly sampled because it's so hard to get to and so remote from uh, human activity. And so we suffer from an ocean of sea blindness. And so one way to think about this is if we're going to clear cut rainforests uh, relative to clear cutting um, the ocean, uh, it actually looks a whole lot different on land than it does in the ocean. Again, that problem is we don't see below the surface. So we wipe out trees. It's pretty obvious what we've done. We wipe out the seafloor. Nobody sees it. And so it's much harder to attract attention to that particular problem. We also suffer from another form of sea blindness, which is lack of knowledge on even the most basic issues. Um, a recent study estimated that we probably know about 9% of the species in the ocean. So that leaves 91%, the question marks in light blue there, that we do not know who is there. They've never been studied by science at all. And that's just for the animals. If we throw in the microbes, that may in fact be an order of magnitude higher than those uh, 2 million that I mentioned for the animals. So this is raises the question, one, what are all these species do, doing? And two, how can we do better on understanding um, uh, what they're, uh, who they are and, and, and what it's all about? As an example of the challenge, this is uh, uh, some work from my PhD student who spent uh, three weeks at sea, $25,000 a day for the ship, another $25,000 for the remotely operated vehicle that she used to collect her data. Um, and this was to sample an area off the coast of Newfoundland where I live that's been declared a marine protected area. I raise this point because it actually just gives us a dot on the global map. And so although we now have better knowledge of that particular part of the world, most of the world is, is still uh, very much unknown. And so when we try to scale that up on a global scale, it becomes very challenging. So this is, raises the point, and Joel alluded to this in his introduction, is that we need to cooperate and work together. Now this is an image from something called the Ocean Biogeographic Information System, which pulls together all the biodiversity data uh, that's available for life in the ocean. And so what you can see here in the warm colors are areas that are well sampled, and in blue, areas that are poorly sampled. And black, of course, is, is land. Um, and what you can see, not so surprisingly, is that Europe is well sampled, North America is reasonably well sampled. But then if you look uh, at a side cutaway of this, you also see that most of that sampling focuses on the near shore and the surface layer of the ocean. So there's a lot of blue there, again, poorly sampled ocean uh, that we have yet to get to. And so that's uh, one form of sea blindness. Another example of this is that we lack a basic map of even our own planet. Now, this particular map, some of you may have seen it, uh, Maria Tharp and uh, Bruce Heason's uh, 1977 map, which really gave us a nice view of what the bottom of the ocean looks like. But the reality is if you zoom in on that, it's really not very detailed. 
And so uh, an estimated 9% of the global ocean has been well mapped. And by what I mean by well mapped is as well as we've mapped the moon or as well as we've mapped Venus. And so only 9% of Earth uh, fits that bill. And so I will point out to you that Venus and the moon have yet to give us a drop of water, a gram of food, or a breath of oxygen. And so clearly we have a major gap. And one of the uh, points to illustrate this, you may recall Malaysia Airlines Flight uh, 370 that went down um, a while back. Uh, the area that we're still looking for, it still has not been found. The areas in red show you areas that are well mapped. So using this multi-beam standard that I mentioned uh, that we uh, actually have similar data for the moon and for Venus. And so it's like looking for a needle in a haystack, but without wearing your glasses while you're looking for that needle. Now, speaking of uh, extraterrestrial bodies, uh, NASA has spent about $4.5 billion to look at Mars. Um, at the same time, to map the seabed would be about $3 billion, but we have not done it. I'm not saying that NASA is not doing good things, but there are priorities, and I will tell you that even if there may be life on Mars, I can guarantee you there is unknown life in the ocean that we have yet to discover. And it's much easier and much cheaper to get to it. Now, fortunately, there is a cure for sea blindness, and that is much better instrumentation, even in the last decade, that produces spectacular data. So this includes sensors, uh, data platforms that we can collect from, autonomous vehicles that take us to areas we can't get to, genetics, tremendous advances there, imaging and computation. And these are all great ways to collect data, data, and more data, which is the stuff that you guys think about a lot. So how can we apply this ocean data more effectively? Now, clearly, uh, we should stop doing things like dynamiting coral reefs. The image there um, on, on your left and right um, illustrate what happens. But how do we go beyond that? Now, I'll give you one example of a better platform. This is one I've been involved with on the West Coast. Um, this is uh, Vancouver, a city very much like San Francisco. The image that you see on the lower left is earthquake activity in the last year. And so no surprise to those of you who live in the San Francisco area, uh, but a major concern. And certainly in Vancouver, it's just a question of time until the big one. And so what can we do about that with ocean sensors? So in Canada, we've set up something called the Neptune uh, Canada Observatory. It's a series of sensors on the seabed connected to shore with a fiber optic cable. And so the fiber optic cable carries uh, uh, power to those sensors and then uh, transports the data back to shore. The idea here is that we can get perhaps a 30 second notice uh, of a potential tsunami should that take place as a result of an earthquake offshore of British Columbia. Now 30 seconds does not sound like a whole lot, but it's enough to shut down the power grid and shut off the gas grid, which of course will save a lot of secondary uh, problems and presumably save a lot of lives. I'm headed to Vancouver later today, so I'm pleased that this is there um, uh, for my visit. Now I want to use another example of how um, seemingly obscure science can lead to uh, interesting places. This is a study done from Yellowstone Park. Um, it's about um, uh, a, a lake there that has uh, these unique looking um, uh, bacteria there. Uh, even to my eyes, this looks pretty dry. It's from a scientific journal. So why do I bring this up at this particular meeting? Well, it turns out that this particular bacterium lives at very high temperatures. And that becomes very important because this guy, Kerry Mullis, came up with the idea of something called uh, polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. And so the idea here is that this enzyme, because it operates at high temperatures, um, a allows a whole variety of genetic sequencing that has revolutionized genetics around the world. Now, um, he got a $10,000 bonus. His uh, discovery made $300 million for his company. Uh, fortunately, he also got a Nobel Prize, so he did uh, come out ahead on that. But all of the technology you hear about on CSI, those paternity lawsuits, all that stuff comes back to this particular type of approach. And I'll show you how we use it in ocean sciences. But the main point here, again, is that we can go from basic science to major breakthroughs in ways that aren't always obvious. Okay, so genetics. I said we've had some major breakthroughs. We can now use genetics to tell who's who. Uh, so in other words, identifying species that even look alike. We can see who mates with who in terms of individuals based on their genetic similarity, um, who's adopted to what particular environment. Uh, and we can also even estimate current and past abundance from genetic data, which is really quite revolutionary. So it really does create some great opportunities. So to illustrate this point, here's some work done uh, by a former student of mine um, uh, and, uh, and some other collaborators 
looking at the genetic structure of populations off eastern Canada. Now, these are species that we fish, including scallop and lobster and, and cod, as well as an invasive species called green crab that creates problems for eelgrass habitat along the east coast. And the question is, are these populations um, one large one, or are they subpopulations? As it turns out, the break point between these populations is not between the island of Newfoundland and the mainland, but between northern and so southern Nova Scotia. I don't know if this pointer will work. Uh, but uh, Nova Scotia there, the right-hand image shows you temperatures, and uh, the little red and blue show you the populations. And so you see that break in populations occurs in northern Nova Scotia. So why does this matter? Well, certainly for managers of these resources, it means they have to manage them separately, or they should manage them separately, because they interact with each other, but uh, they do not cross very much uh, between one another. And so uh, one of the other challenges that we can look at with genetics, this one is more controversial, is that we need protein to fill, feed about 7 billion people. And so that's a, a lot of people clearly increasing. And um, what you see here is that wild fisheries shown in light blue have pretty much flattened out. And I think in the future we are not going to extract more fisheries resources from wild fisheries. On the other hand, aquaculture has continued to increase. And you see the dark blue there is very much on the rise and uh, it's increasing around the world. Now this raises the question, again, controversial, but we can use hardy Atlantic salmon, put in a Chinook salmon growth gene, uh, put in a promoter from ocean pout, and what we end up with is year-round rapid growth um, and a more effective aquaculture industry. There are complications associated with that, no question, but again, we have a lot of people to feed, and so there are potential solutions. Data on genetics has been a critical part of that story. Now, um, along a different line, this is something called the Great Ocean Conveyor Belt. Some of you may know about it. Um, there was a cheesy movie called The Day After Tomorrow that uh, actually focused on this um, Great Ocean Conveyor Belt. And the uh, area in red that you see are, are surface currents, and then the blue areas are the deep currents. Now, this is the largest circulation pattern on Earth. Uh, the, it's really important because it extracts carbon dioxide and heat from the atmosphere uh, and transports it, transports it into the deeper layers of the ocean. Um, I'm going to come back to why this is important in just a moment. So, a lot of you, and certainly I, use a mouse uh, to work with our computer or a touchpad. And it's really a basic tool, but very effective in terms of what it does. In oceanography, we have something called a CTD, a Conductivity Temperature Depth Profiler, which, as the name implies, gets us temperature, salinity, and depth. Salinity is the salt content of the water. Now, physical oceanographers can do a lot with this information. It defines a lot of the environment but it also allows them to model circulation. And so that simulation I showed you earlier was based on this sort of data. Now in the past, we would take this instrument that you see here, lower it down, bring it back up, move somewhere else, lower it down, required a ship and not a lot of uh, uh, great coverage. So uh, what's happened now is there's a new program called the Argo Float Program, which you can see here. And the idea here is it's basically CTDs that passively drift with the ocean, they sink down, come up to the surface, send their data back via satellite, sink down, and keep drifting. The reason this is really important is that it improves our coverage tremendously. You can see here data from 1934. That's roughly when my parents were born. Uh, and so you can see how little of, of the ocean we covered at that time. Then we have uh, 1960, which is roughly when I was born. Somewhat better coverage, but still relatively poor. 1985, things are getting better, uh, probably a little bit before many of you were born. Um, but then when we get to 2009, which we'll say is more or less now, really good coverage. And so these Argo floats have had a huge effect uh, on our sampling of the ocean for its physics. And so that's what enables those tremendous models that I showed you before. And so there's the Argo float, as you can see. So I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to what I'm going to move on to next, which is acoustic tags. These are little tiny tags about the size of a pencil eraser that we can surgically implant in animals to see how they move. And so the idea here is that one can get a very good idea of how animals utilize particular types of habitat. And so some of my graduate students have been using this technology to understand how uh, juvenile cod use particular habitats along the coastline. So here you see one of these little tiny tags and these fingers for scale. Uh, and so what she's found, the little black dots that you see in the green area are locations of juvenile cod. The black circle that you see with the irregular outline is one of their predators and where the predators hang out. And so what's happening here is it tells us that these juvenile cod are hanging out in the eelgrass because the predators can't get them there. These predators can include other cod because they're cannibals. They'll eat them in a heartbeat if they're bigger. 
uh, but uh, these uh, other predators, again, hang out and can't get into the eelgrass because it's too dense for them to swim around. So what this tells us, then, is that knowledge of particular habitat use can help us prioritize areas that we should protect if we're concerned about these juvenile cod, which we are. As I mentioned to you earlier, this population has crashed and not recovered in the 25 years since that crash took place. This is another example. This, this is something called uh, satellite tags, which have been used uh, on this coast to track a whole variety of marine mammals and other species to see where they use, to identify uh, blue highways and corridors through the ocean where they're particularly active. And so again, this is uh, knowing where they occur can help us prioritize activities within those areas uh, in, in a more effective way. Now these satellite tags uh, require a satellite connection. You probably know that GPS, the global positioning system, does not work underwater. Uh, but these animals that come up to the surface, when they surface, that allows a chance to exchange data with satellites, and then they dive down again and collect more data. There's another variation on this called pop-up tags. The idea here is these tags collect information, including when the sun sets and when the sun rises. They collect data for a period of time, then the uh, tags pop up to the surface and again radio the data back home. So that gives us position and location, and we can even put things like temperature and salinity probes uh, on those tags. And so they become, if you like, uh, sort of living ships that go out and collect data in remote locations. Now here's an example of how we can use ocean models uh, to better manage the way that we use the oceans. This is some work done by a postdoc working with me and several others trying to model how shrimp, which are a species that became very abundant after the collapse of cod, disperse along the coast of Labrador and Newfoundland. Uh, the take-home story on this is that they're really well connected from north to south. So the, the Labrador current, which goes along the, the coast of Labrador, sweeps them towards the south. What that means is that you can fish the ones on the south all you want. Because their offspring are getting swept offshore, they're not going to contribute to future populations. On the other hand, the populations to the north seed the areas to the south and are very important in terms of future generations. And so again, for ocean managers, this is really critical information to manage those populations and how we uh, uh, fish them much more effectively. We can also look to a whole variety of uh, better sampling platforms. This is the remotely operated vehicle called Ropos that I've used quite a bit, uh, me and my students, for our research in Canada. Uh, it's basically a tethered vehicle. We lower down to the bottom, collect imagery and other sorts of samples. Um, and so what I wanted to show you is um, uh, this particular image, uh, you can see this deep water coral. Uh, this coral could be 100 years old, it could actually be 1,000 years old. I don't know how old this particular specimen is, but it provides habitat for a whole variety of other species. The importance of these corals was really only recognized perhaps 20 years ago off the coast of Norway. Now we're discovering them off of Canada as well. As you can imagine, bottom fishing gear has quite a nasty effect on these corals, and so there's a priority right now in Canada to try and protect these habitats. What you see here is redfish, again, hanging out around these corals. They look like they were sleeping. Um, what's really interesting also about this image is that it's a, a frame grab from a video, and yet the quality is spectacular. So when my colleague sent it, I was just amazed at how good it is. So this also means that imagery is getting so good now, we can use it much more effectively to figure out what's in an image. One of the challenges that we face uh, with science is that we produce all these studies, and they don't necessarily affect ocean policy. So trying to find ways to bring together ocean science and ocean policy is really important, and I would argue that the results could be simply divine. So one of the things we can do with this uh, sort of data is to produce better maps of pressures and how we're responding to those pressures. This is some work done by uh, Ben Halpern uh, just down the coast in Santa Barbara. And what this does is it maps ocean problems. So areas in blue, relatively few pressures. Areas in red, a lot of pressures. And so what you can see very quickly from this is that the poles are the least impacted and coastal areas are the worst impacted. And so at least we know what sort of activity is going on based on that amalgamated data. He also produced a study looking at the, the success we're having in trying to create protection. Now there's a rule of thumb that ecologists have developed that we should try and protect a minimum of 20% of the habitat of a given species. What you see in green are species that actually do have 20% uh, protection. And obviously, they're, um, they're very few. The areas in pink have effectively no protection. And so we're not doing terribly well when you try and mate these two maps with each other in terms of pressures and protecting against those pressures. Now, one of the other things we can do with biodiversity data is to try and figure out where the biodiversity hotspots are globally. 
And so what you see here are maps that are produced of both coastal and also oceanic taxa. And what you see there is that there's higher diversity in the tropics for coastal data, or coastal species, I should say, and then oceanic taxa. It's more towards temperate latitudes. So this also tells us where we might want to prioritize in terms of our conservation efforts. The problem, though, is that this map is not zoomable. It's very crude in terms of its resolution, and when you try and get in at a finer scale, the data becomes very weak very quickly. The other thing is this data is very incomplete. It focuses on well-known groups such as fishes and mammals, but a lot of the other groups, including invertebrates, are not necessarily well represented by this analysis. Now, I want to come back to that ocean conveyor belt that I mentioned earlier uh, and talk to you a little bit about climate change and how we can use data to better understand climate change. Now, the ocean has actually absorbed a lot of the excess CO2, perhaps about a third, and about 90% of the excess heat that we've thrown into the ocean um, since industrialization, thrown into the atmosphere since industrialization. Now, one way to think about this is that we actually add the equivalent of about four Hiroshima levels of explosions of heat per second since industrialization began. So that's a huge amount of heat. And had the oceans not absorbed 90% of that, um, we would be a lot hotter than we are today. The reality is that the upper uh, few meters of the ocean uh, contain more heat than all of the atmosphere combined. And so this becomes really important when we go back to that ocean conveyor belt that I mentioned before. And so if we look at where this heat is being removed, there's a hot spot on the North Atlantic uh, near Norway and near Newfoundland where water sinks into that deep ocean conveyor. And when it does so, it transports away carbon dioxide and it also transports away heat. The good news is that it takes it out of the atmosphere for up to 1,000 years. Eventually, that water will resurface somewhere in the North Pacific or elsewhere. But in any case, it's taken out of circulation for a period of time. So understanding ocean circulation allows us to understand these heat budgets and give us much better climate projections than we would otherwise. Now, a lot of you have insurance. You may have insurance on your home, um, on your car, or even on your pet. The dog is actually mine, the car and the house are not. Uh, but the point here is that we rarely take out insurance on the environment. And so in the case of cod, we had this major collapse of cod populations because we did not take out any form of insurance. By insurance here, I'm referring to protection of different sorts. And so marine protected areas, I would argue, are an effective ocean insurance policy. Now what you see here, this is something produced by the, the Wade Institute out here in California. Uh, where they track the level of marine protection around the world. And so the estimate they come up with is that we have about 5% of the ocean has some degree of protection. That may be a very limited amount of protection, but nonetheless, some level. Um, about 2.2% 2, 2, 2 of the global ocean um, is highly protected. And so there's still quite a long way to go in terms of ocean protection. Now in Canada, our government promised 10% protected areas <clears throat> by 2020. It looks like we will deliver on that. We have a very pro-environment uh, government uh, right now, which is great news. They've also promised to try and do uh, better in terms of uh, increasing that percent to up to 25. So what do we protect? Typically charismatic or emblematic species, special habitats that we know contribute disproportionately to the environment. We also want to protect representative environments. That is to say, areas that aren't so special, but we want them to represent um, what those environments ought to look like. And then there are strategic species who might create, as we have done in Canada, uh, a protected area to try and enhance lobster populations nearby. These are all good things. But like any financial portfolio, the issue is diversity. It's good to have a diverse portfolio if you're going to achieve really good protection for an environment. So here's another example of where we could do better, and we have the information to do better, although we have not done so. This is a, a former student of mine um, tagged these adult cod, uh, as well as older juveniles, to see where they moved. Now, this is a subspecies of cod known as golden cod. And so Canada created a marine protected area to try and um, uh, halt the decline in, these spe in this species. Uh, and so that area was protected. The numbers continued to decline. And so he tried to figure out why. And so by putting these uh, acoustic tags into the cod, he could figure out where they were moving. And it turned out that the marine protected area, shown here in red, was not enough to protect the entire habitat these cod would, would utilize. So every spring, these cod would come out to the coast to feed on capelin. They'd get scooped up in the fishery, and the population continued to decline. Now, efforts from our federal uh, fisheries agency to either expand that area or to uh, change the fishing season 
have met with great resistance. And so we know why the population continues to decline and, and why the MPA is failing, but at the moment, at least, we're not fixing the problem. And so you can see then again, this sort of data at least tells us why we're in trouble and what we could do about it. Now here's an interesting uh, example of some work uh, Anna Metaxas from Canada and Martha Nizinski from the US did together. I was involved in this cruise where we're trying to understand these deep water coral populations off the East Coast. Now, uh, as you may guess, the, the, the line that you see there is the Canada-US border. It's called the Hague Line. Uh, corals don't care about it. And so the way they work is that they produce these larval stages that don't swim very well. They disperse with the currents, in essence, as is the case with many marine species. And so if you look at where these uh, uh, coral uh, larvae disperse, it turns out that they mostly move from the US side to the Canadian side. And so uh, the interesting uh, twist this brings, which is starting to work, is that US protection affects what happens in Canada. As you can imagine, the same sort of issue applies to other species, including uh, species such as salmon uh, in the Pacific. And so uh, what we see then is that the areas that are most closely linked are right at the Canada-US border. And if we want to sustain those populations, we need to think about both of them. And so again, that data on dispersal becomes very important. Here's an example of uh, right whales uh, in eastern Canada. And so this is one of the most endangered species on Earth. There are estimated to be something like uh, 400 individuals of this species remaining globally. And um, uh, mortalities are an issue. And typically, they're caused by blunt force trauma, where these whales are uh, in collisions with ships. It kills them, and the numbers continue to decline. And so what Canada did on this uh, was to create an area that they knew, based on data on movement of right whales, ordered ships to slow down as they went through those areas. And so what we saw is a decrease in whale mortality from 12 in 2017 to zero in 2018. Now, that seems really good. It, it is good. Um, unfortunately, uh, last year, there were another eight mortalities. And it seems to be an issue of compliance and perhaps, again, revisiting exactly where those slowdown areas take place. Now, so this raises a broader question of how we get from good ocean data through that chasm that exists between science and policy to good ocean policy. What are the impediments to making that happen? So first of all, uh, better sensors. Physicists and chemists have really good ocean sensors. Biologists do not. We have cameras, which are sort of useful. Uh, they are for some species. But for many other species, not really that useful. So we need to get better sensors. And I'll show you an example of some work being, uh, being done over in Monterey that will help us move that forward. Second issue is better automation. Right now, the main way that we identify organisms is graduate students sitting at microscopes or at video, looking at it for hours and hours, figuring out who's who. There are efforts to automate this process. This is the sort of thing you guys think about. But those efforts are still um, incomplete, and we have a long way to go. A third issue is better data platforms. Uh, we're starting to use autonomous underwater vehicles, very effective at some tools. I showed you the CTD example for the physical oceanographers. But we still need to do better for other disciplines. And then finally, better science literacy. People like me coming out to talk to people like you, and you willing to listen, and me willing to talk, which I think is very helpful in getting the message out that we need better data and better ocean policy if we really are serious about sustainability. OK. Now, one of the other um, uh, key advances with genetics I mentioned earlier is that we can identify species much more effectively. And so there's something called genetic barcoding, which is very much like the barcodes you see in the department store, where each barcode, it's based on a single gene, is unique for each species. And so uh, my colleague, Chris Sholin, again over at Mon Monterey Bay Research Institute, has developed a molecular lab in a can, in essence. And what he's done with this, it's called the Environmental Sample Processor is that it sucks in a water sample and tests whether the genes are there for a toxic dinoflagellate. Now, some, toxic, some dinoflagellates are harmless. One strain will do nothing to you. The other will kill you. And so if you eat a lot of seafood, particularly mollusks, uh, so clams and so on, you really need to be careful about this because these toxins are very serious. And so through this tool, it's possible to collect a sample and know right away if those uh, toxic species are on the go. And so if one can scale that up to think about environmental DNA, the idea there is you suck up a little water sample, any tissue that's sloughed off of any animal that swam by, you might be able to sequence it and say, aha, all these species live in this environment, which would be great if we could actually do that. And so this leads towards the idea of mass sequencing, that we can know exactly who's in an environment 
just by throwing a water sample or a sediment sample in a blender and seeing what, what turns up. So that's still a long way off. There's still a lot of work to do. But again, the potential is there thanks to that study that began in that Yellowstone Lake back in the 1960s. So I want to wind things down by asking you about the oceans of tomorrow and what it is we want to see. I think most of you will agree we do not want to see this invasive algae clogging our coastline uh, like uh, during this uh, photograph during the, the China Olympics. Um, these scenes that we see from the east coast of Canada I think are more what we have in mind, a healthy, sustainable ocean that delivers the sorts of resources and benefits that we've enjoyed for a very long time and would like to continue to enjoy into the future. So what some people see when they look uh, towards the ocean is an opportunity to make money. That's fair enough. If we can do that in a sustainable way, I think that's important. But I think other people look towards the ocean and see a garbage tank, a, a garbage bucket, which I think is both unreal and unfortunate in terms of a perception. There is still a lot of the ocean that's very pristine, very healthy, and working very well. Um, and I think we should do everything we can do to preserve it. When I look towards the ocean, I see opportunity. I see a wide diversity of life. I see opportunity for uh, new discoveries, for new resources uh, that we can utilize, new medicines. They're all out there, but we need sustainability as a major strategy to make that happen. And data can certainly help us in trying to understand these resources and manage them sustainably. So I'm going to finish up on that, and thank you all for coming and listening. <laughs>